One soft autumn morning, as John and Sue set off for school, Mr. Peters called good-naturedly to them out of the caravan window. Uh, you two watch your step today, because I'll be keeping an eye on you. How do you mean, Dad? asked John. Their father grinned. Oh, Mr. Braithwaite's got me a little job. I'll be fixing some slates on the school roof, and I'll be looking out for you. Cheerio, then. He waved as they slipped through the gate and out of sight. They'd only gone a little way along the lane when the children met Wurzel Gummidge, sitting on a stile by Ten Acre Field and watching the rooks eat the corn. Hello, Wurzel, called Sue. Hello, you three, the scarecrow replied. Why for is you all in such a hurry, then, eh? We're in a hurry, said John scornfully, because we've got to get to school. And if you'd ever been to school, you'd know there's two of us, not three. Oh, I never had no need to go to school, did I? Because I had this here clever head once, but taught me all manner of things. It were a Christmas present, what I got given by the crow man. Oh, not that head were always hanging around school, so it were picking up all kinds of facts. Weren't no more nor an old turnip, but that tarnation pesky head were clever. It learned me history, so it did, and geography, and it learned me no end of things about shepherding sheep. John looked sceptical. Could it do mathematics? Oh, ah, it could do that there in mathematics, all right. The scarecrow wrinkled up his nose with the effort of remembering what his clever head had taught him. Two sheeps and three sheeps is five sheeps. Oh, fantastic, sneered John. Wurzel Gummish tried again. And four taties and five taties is eight taties. How's that? The children exchanged a glance, concealing their grins. Hmm. Near enough, said Sue, charitably. Anyway, what happened to your clever head? The scarecrow's face darkened in annoyance. I hid it. I hid that head somewhere safe. I didn't want to lose it, see, on account of it being so pesky clever. Matter of fact, what that head itself has thought of its own hiding place. Trouble is, I ain't never had another head since as were clever enough to find it. Well, perhaps you'd be just as clever, Wurzel, if you went to school like us, suggested Sue. The scarecrow scowled. I just told you, young missy, I dang well don't need to go to no school, not with an head as clever as what I got it in the way. Yes, well, what's the good of having a clever head if you don't know where it is, said John, as they scampered away down the lane. Proper little smarty pants, that there titchy pesky human thinks he is. But if I finds that there clever head, I can not teach him a thing or three, dang me if I don't. For a moment the scarecrow scowled as he tried to recall where he'd hidden his clever head. And then suddenly his face brightened. Oh, that's it. That dang school, that's where I hid it. Tarnation ticket, I'm sure on it. Dang pesky head, with that there fun to learning things, it wouldn't have hidden itself anywhere else except at that there school. And by the time the children were busy with the algebra that Miss Jameson, the schoolmistress, had set them, Wurzel Gummidge's beady eyes were fixed on the ladder Mr. Peters had propped against the wall of the school while he went to collect his tools. When all was quiet, he raced across the yard and shinned up it towards the roof, pausing at the window of the schoolroom to glance in and see what was going on. Bored with algebra, a little girl looked up and gasped in surprise, attracting everyone else's attention. Uh, no talking, please, said Miss Jameson firmly as the children giggled at the side of the scarecrow's face, peering in. Get on with the work, I set you. The scarecrow's face disappeared. The children waited. Very slowly, inch by inch, Wurzel Gummidge lowered himself into view again, from above the window, upside down. As the giggles turned to laughter, Miss Jameson followed the children's eyes and caught sight of the scarecrow's hat waving goodbye. Right, she cried. So that's it. Leave this to me, children, and remain quite silent while I'm away. And she marched out of the room. Scrambling about on the roof, the scarecrow peered into gutters and into disused house martin's nests, and eventually stretched up to feel inside a crevice between two tall chimney stacks. Oh, I, I know there was up here somewhere, he breathed, as his twiggy hand emerged with a sacking wrapped bundle. I wonder if it's as clever as it always was. Straddling the roof, he laid the clever head in his lap. His workaday head came off quite easily. He put it down on the ledge of the chimney stack, eased and squeezed his clever head into place, looked around in satisfaction, and tried a couple of preliminary blinks. Now then, let's try it. Two times two is four. Ah. Three times two is six. Ah. Eight eights, sixty-four. Ah, so they are. I say, came a thin voice, interrupting his practice. 
I say, do you hear me? You there, tramp! Wurzel Gummidge glanced down disdainfully and caught sight of Miss Jameson in the schoolyard. Don't you go bothering and bothering me now, missus. I'm trying out me new head. None of your cheek, shrilled Miss Jameson indignantly. I happen to be a member of the teaching staff of this school, and I demand to know what you're doing up there. I shall require a satisfactory answer, she piped. The scarecrow grinned down at her. His new head had put him in an uncommonly good mood. I'll give you an answer, missus. All right. <laughs> I'll give you as many answers as you want, provided, of course, as I get the satisfactory question first off. Ask me a question about history, he suggested. Realising that the only way of shifting the strange figure on the roof was to go along with him, Miss Jameson sighed. Oh, all right. Anything to get you down from there. In what year did Queen Elizabeth I ascend the throne? Uh, 1588. Go on, ask me another. <laughs> Try me on something else. Geography, if you want. I don't know what it is. Poetry, nuclear physics, shepherding sheep, anything that takes your fancy, missus. Despite herself, Miss Jameson was quite intrigued. Um, where is Timbuktu? Central Mali in Western Africa. Estimated population, 10,000. That's not counting scarecrows, of course. <laughs> the schoolmistress quivered with delight at her discovery. But this is quite incredible. I must inform the headmaster of this. Now, you stay there. Don't go away. I shall be back and on. And she hurried away across the playground. It took Miss Jameson only a few moments to persuade Mr. Foster, her headmaster, that she had found a genius sitting on the school roof. But in that short time, Wurzel Gummidge had shinned down the ladder again and made his way back to Ten Acre Field. And Mr. Peters had returned to get on with the replacing of the broken tiles. Um, uh, I say, called Mr. Foster, um, uh, hello there. Uh, would you mind coming down for a moment, please? I I've got something I'd like you to do. And he rubbed his hands with glee as the puzzled Mr. Peters scrambled down the ladder and followed him into the classroom. Uh, now then, children, beamed the headmaster, general knowledge. And this afternoon, for a change, I'm going to sit back and let you ask the questions. And this gentleman is going to give us all the answers. What? Squeaked Mr. Peters in alarm for he'd never been much of a brain when he was at school, although he'd always been good with his hands. John and Sue, who knew that perfectly well, exchanged a horrified glance. Crikey, whispered Sue, sinking down as if she hoped the seat would swallow her. Crikey Moses, agreed John, following her down. Uh, because he's an expert on general knowledge, uh, aren't you, sir? asked Mr. Foster. Mr. Peters floundered, glancing at the door as if he was wondering whether to make a dash for it. Well, I, uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say that, he muttered. The headmaster chuckled. <laughs> come now, come now. No false modesty. Uh, this gentleman, children, has a photographic memory. He can answer questions on any subject under the sun, and possibly about the sun. Eh, well, sir, eh, well, <laughs> Mr. Peters looked miserable. John and Sue, embarrassed, wished they were somewhere else. The headmaster decided to set the ball rolling. Now, he cried. First question. An easy one for starters, huh? <laughs> In what year did Columbus discover America? At that moment, Mr. Peters wished that Columbus had never even heard of America. Um, uh, 1066, wasn't it? He guessed, hopelessly, dredging up the only date that he could remember. The headmaster chortled. <laughs> Very funny, yes. <laughs> Serves me right for asking such a simple question, eh? <laughs> Outside, Wurzel Gummidge, who'd come back to collect his workaday head from the rooftop, pricked up his ears at the sound of the word question and peered in through the window as he climbed down the ladder. Uh, now, seriously, the headmaster continued, what are the principal exports of Thailand? As Mr. Peters shuffled uncomfortably from foot to foot, his mind a complete blank, the scarecrow mouthed the answer through the window, though no one could hear. Mr. Foster frowned. John and Sue caught one another's eyes while their father ummed and erred. Shall we rescue him? whispered John. I think we've got to, his sister replied urgently. John took a deep breath, raised his hand and called, I've got a question. Who won the cup final in 1953? As quick as a computer, Mr. Peters rattled off the answer with a happy smile. This was something he did know about. A Blackpool beat Bolton Wanderers 4-3. Uh, Stanley Morrison got a hat trick for Blackpool, and Stanley Matthews got his first cup winner's medal. The children were impressed. From the front row, a fat, spotty boy called out, Who won the World Cup in 1962? 
Mr. Peters' grin widened. These were easy. Uh, the World Cup in 1962 was played in Chile, and in the final, Czechoslovakia beat Yugoslavia by three goals to one. Another boy stuck his hand in the air. Who were the Football League champions in the season 1968-1969? Uh, Leeds United, Liverpool were the runners-up. There was a round of applause from the children. The Scarecrow, not much interested in football, finished climbing down the ladder and wandered away with his workaday head under his arm. Mr Foster frowned. This wasn't quite the sort of general knowledge that he'd had in mind. Uh, yes, he said, yes, yes, very good, but I, I don't think we want all the questions to be about football, do we? Uh, can someone give us another subject? John glanced at Sue and nodded. She jumped to her feet. Which horse won the Grand National in 1964? Mr. Peter smiled smugly, took a deep breath and answered, uh, Team Spirit, owned by Jay Goodwin, trained by Fook Wallin, ridden by Willie Robinson, came in at 18 to 1. The room erupted to thunderous applause from the children. And Mr. Foster realised there was no stopping them as they bombarded the happy Mr. Peters with strings of sporting questions. General knowledge was the most successful lesson of the day. In the afternoon on their way home from school, as the sun was fading into a sullen burning ball over the hill, the children jumped the stile and skipped across the field to visit the scarecrow back on duty on his pole. Hello, Wurzel, cried Sue cheerfully as he opened one baleful eye to stare at them. What happened then, Wurzel? Did you find your clever head? asked John. Hello, you three kids, the scarecrow croaked. John shook his head. He didn't find it. The scarecrow sneered. Oh, that's how much you know, Mr. Clever Clogs, because I did find it, see, and I've had it on and all. Sue gazed up at him. Did it know a lot of things, Wurzel? The scarecrow's face became quite pompous. That there red, my girl, knows everything there is to be known. As a matter of fact, he said, wriggling uncomfortably, that there red knows a sight too much. Well, where is it? asked Sue. Id, said Wurzel Gummidge firmly. I had to get rid of it. Sir, it gave me an headache, it did, spouting all them facts and figures. It couldn't give you a headache, argued John, logically, his head cocked on one side. It could only do that to itself. The scarecrow sneered again, curling his lip at the boy. You not so dang smart, young fella, my lad. Because as it happens, he gave me stomach an headache. Little Robin Redbreast's eggs whirling round and round still. Sue frowned. So where did you hide it this time, Wurzel? Wurzel Gummidge shrugged indifferently. Somewhere safe. But even I don't know where. Only that there clever head knows where it did itself. And I ain't going looking for it never again, so I ain't. For all I cares, wherever it's hid, it's stopping it.